So I'm standing here with Jack Brewitt, who is a professor in uh, animal, physio animal physiology, actually. Yeah. And you are from America, from North Carolina. I live in North Carolina in the mountains, and I'm, I also serve on the Arboretum Board. So I'm very interested in plants and landscape. What a good place to meet here today. <laughs> it is. So tell me about this North, North Carolina. I mean, a lot of Swedish people don't know much about it, but it seems to be a fantastic place. North Carolina is a coastal state. And it runs from the sea to the mountains, and our highest mountains are uh, 2,500 meters. Oh, that's rather high. Yes. I must say. And so that would make you quite an ideal interesting zone to have both the coastal climate and then the cold air coming down from the mountains. We have uh, snow. <laughs> that is a good thing to <laughs> and have. And we have the beach oh. and everything in between. But we have the most biodiverse area in North America because of our weather patterns and our mountains. Wow, so that would really be something for anyone who, with a botanical interest to come visit North Carolina. Oh, uh, we hope so. Yes. <laughs> and our arboretum. Yeah, how it, big is your arboretum? Our arboretum is uh, approximately 200 hectares. And it, which is a good size. Which, mm. which uh, runs from the river to the top of the mountains. And so it has many different micro-ecosystems mm. within, the, within the arboretum. So tell me a little bit, what kind of species do we find there? From, from, we start with the trees. Well, we probably have, um, I'm going to say at least 30 to 40 different varieties of trees in our mm. mountains. They are pretty natural uh, mm. landscape. Uh, the glaciers uh, brought hemlocks from Canada oh. into our area Wow! many, many years ago, thousands of years ago. And so our, our ecosystem actually reflects a lot of the ecosystem in Montreal because the glaciers brought all of those plants from Canada. Into wow, the early hitchhikers. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so you Amazing. Can see, you can see a diverse variety of plants, mm -hmm. ferns, trees, grasses, flowers, a lot of hydrangea, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of rhododendron, mountain laurel, uh, and we also have lots of natural uh, plants that are used for food. Oh, really? Yes. And so we, we harvest ginseng, for example. Oh, that grows naturally there? It, it, it naturally in the area. Wow. <laughs> so well, that's good and healthy. And so one of the things do, we do is study the diversity of plants and, and how unique our area is. Exactly. So, so those rhododendrons you have, for example, those are Native American rhododendrons. My, my, law, my yard, my backyard is Native American rhododendron oh. <laughs> and you, mountain laurel. Yeah, exactly. Well, we have a, quite a lot of rhododendron yeah. here as well. You probably feel right at home then. We do. Yeah. And of course, the, the rhododendron that have been cultivated mm -hmm. and developed have many different color patterns that mm -hmm. differ from the native Oh yes, of course. And and they bloom earlier, and they have more robust blooming. So we love rhododendron. Oh, we I can imagine. Earlier. They do well on a large scale. Mm -hmm. They do. So, uh, but these are the Appalachian Mountains, and they stretch quite a far bit. They stretch from Maine in the very mm -hmm. northeast part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. all the way down to Georgia, which is in the southern part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the total distance would be um, three thousand kilometers or something like that. Oh, and is it possible to go and hike there and go on trails? We have what is called the Appalachian Trail, yeah. and it's marked the entire distance, and so it takes about five months for an active hiker to hike the entire Appalachian oh. Trail. Oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> I'm tempted. I'm very tempted. <laughs> that sounds lovely. But so having a mountain range, I mean, I know that mountains are very good to study the effects of climate change sure. and, and future scenarios of what might happen. So, so how does it look in your area? Well, you know, I have a team uh, of scientists worldwide that I work with, and we're looking at agriculture and food production 50 mm. years in the future. Oh. And it's interesting, even in our state, our local area is not going to change very much in the edge of the mountains. But at the coast, it's going to change immensely. Oh, yeah. sea, very interesting sea level that, rise, exactly. it's going to get drier. <gasps> and so we can, we can actually see it happening already mm. in, in our area. It's interesting areas. how climate change will, I mean, for some areas, like you say, they're just buffered. They're sure. going to be rather stable, right. whereas other areas, there's going to be gonna... more, huge changes. Exactly. <gasps> and water is going to be a limiting factor in the areas. Definitely. More so than uh, temperature, water mm. will become rate limiting. Mm. Uh, for food production or for growing plants. And so that's what we see happening in the world. Exactly. So are you also part of, of uh, 
I mean, there's lots of, of movements now for how to, to change the agriculture to make it more water, um, water spare, sparing, so to say. Um, are there any attempts in your area, for example, for no-till movement or different kinds of food sure. forestry or stuff like that? Well, we, virtually all of our land is no-till mm. production now. We, we do not till anymore. <laughs> uh, we're using subsurface irrigation, mm -hmm. so we reduce our water use by 60% or 70%. Oh. Uh, we're coating the seeds with new natural microbes that strengthen oh. the roots. That's and make them good. absorb the water and nutrients more efficiently. Exactly, because we've been, I mean, people don't always understand. We have, it's rather new knowledge for some it reason is. that all the microbes in the soil are actually what makes the plants That's right. able to exist. There wouldn't be bland plants if they weren't for the microbes. And I know that in England, for example, they often put on mycorrhizal fungi on the root exactly. roots to, to get them to establish <laughs> better. But you actually coat the seeds. We're, we're doing, we're coating the seeds with, uh, and uh, for large crops like <gasps> wheat and rice and maize and oh. soybeans. Uh, and also for plant for potted plants. All right. And we think in the future we're going to have a lot as we discover more mm. about the microbes, we will use more natural products to replace mm. chemicals and and synthet synthetic materials that we use today. So the future in agriculture is going to be Back to nature. <laughs> Back to nature sounds better. It's lovely to hear something positive about it because occasionally it does seem rather drab when one talks about the future. Yeah, so uh, we're, we were, we're more, po more positive about the future than some are. And what we've looked at is there is a lot of land in Canada, Russia, in the northern latitudes yes. that has very short growing seasons now. Mm. But their growing seasons are going to be six to eight weeks longer. So they will be able to grow mm, much more of space. food mm. than they have in the past. So we think that's a positive aspect that we that's, need to talk about. <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank and I hope you. you enjoy your day here. I'm going to enjoy it immensely. There's a lot of rhododendrons I think you like, even <laughs> though they're not in bloom. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.